Welcome to ETSU Department of Psychiatry Grand Rounds. Dr. Hendrick is our speaker today. Dr. Hendrick is Chief of Psychiatry at Mountain Home VA Medical Center. He is an Associate Professor of Psychiatry at ETSU as well. Directs the Neurosciences Didactics Track for the psychiatry resident here. Dr. Hendrick is a graduate of the Medical College of Virginia, where he also trained in psychiatry. He is a Distinguished Fellow of the APA, holds a Distinguished Service Award from the United States Public Health Service. He is recipient of Irma J. Bland Award for Psychiatric Resident Teaching by the American Psychiatric Association. He's twice been named Psychiatry Resident Teacher of the Year at ETSU as well. Dr. Hendrick has a specific focus on behavioral knowledge, neurology, and neuroanatomy as it applies to behavior. Dr. Hendrick. I was going to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to take a moment of executive privilege and say that today was supposed to be Dr. Barton Evans' grand rounds. And I think, I hope we won't disappoint those of you that came specifically for that. He had uh, fallen ill yesterday, so Dr. Goodkin and I made arrangements. Dr. Goodkin was kind enough to give me five minutes of notice to get prepared. Uh, but fortunately, we had a little something ready to go. Um, I'll, I'll also say that my pink jacket is not in error, okay? Many of you uh, know that I'm many things, but I'm quite the traditional Southerner, including living for a while in Louisville, Kentucky. And the Kentucky Derby is this weekend, and today is Philly Day at Churchill Downs. The Phillies run today. So I have my pink jacket on, in part, to take note of the Phillies at uh, Churchill Downs, but also in solidarity with our folks uh, that we work with in oncology because National Breast Cancer Awareness Day today, I think, as well. So we want to take those things into account. And uh, with that, we'll move out of my sim simple Southern heritage and move into my somewhat more complicated uh, activities, which include trying to understand a little something about how the brain works. And believe me, I'm sure it is just a little something. The way that we're looking at the brain these days, of course, initially, we looked at the anatomy of the brain. And the gross anatomy, the morphology of the brain, was the initial study. And back in the days of Hippocrates and Galen, things were named. And that causes tons of confusion, because even though they were named in interesting ways, they weren't named in affiliation with their functional nature. And we see now, in modern technology, in the second slide showing the connectome, we see these various hubs where information processing occurs in the brain, where interactive information comes together and can be processed in a wide variety of ways. We're going to talk about some of that. And then you also see in the third picture here, diffuse, diffusion tensor imaging, that megadata uh, and big data will allow us now to program in the brain. And we can use this kind of database to begin to look at not only the interrelationships of the wiring connections, but how those wiring connections actually influence neurotransmitter positioning in the brain, and a variety of other things of that nature. So I have no disclosures other than the fact that I work for the VA and ETSU. And I remind you that initially, look at the gross morphology and gross anatomy of the brain and spinal cord was where we started this agenda centuries ago. Now, we're able to do things like, for instance, plastinate the vasculature of the brain and get a sense of exactly how complex that vasculature is. The plastination process will also allow us to look at the vascular uh, circumstances of the entire head. You'll notice here, not only is the brain highly vascular, but the face itself is also extremely vascularized. So with information like that, one of the things that we can do is look at these connectomic relationships in such a way to begin to understand how do they influence temporal blood flow in the brain? How do, they, how do these shifts uh, allow the brain networks to process information? 
and we can get a look at the brain network. You get a look here at kind of the frontal, parietal, temporal lobes specifically. This is kind of a whole brain network look. And you notice some things like right in the middle there, you see a, uh, no, I don't think I have my pointer with me. Here's one. You see, for instance, uh, let me see if I can figure out how to make this work. Yeah. Like, for instance, there's the thalamus, okay? So, of course, the somatosensory gating area. So you get a look at the overall brain network. This kind of computer data allows us to look as small as the level of a single neuron, or we can see a more sophisticated look at the control consensus connectome. Now, this is an interesting thing, and I want you to take note of this for a second. Many of you that have been in my various classes on behavioral neuro and things of that nature have heard me kind of pound my fist on the desk about the brain is a bicameral object. The left and the right are, are not the same. But really, when you take a quick look here at the control consensus connectome, they're really very, very similar. So the connectome itself is very similar, but you might notice one difference. On the right side, the hubs are actually a little larger overall. Well, now, why would that be? The left brain is our verbal and analytic brain, but our right brain is constantly reviewing the environment to see not only what is going on right now, but what is coming next. And so, this information processing on the right side may actually have a faster or a more intense processing mode, because even though that is going on subconsciously all the time, it is constantly uh, observing the environment to see what's next. So these brain networks are becoming increasingly clear. Initially, the uh, mapping was pretty simplistic, as you see here. But then, as the computers got more sophisticated, we were able to get these wonderful graphics. And what you see here is corpus callosum right here. And then these big, thick blue cords are the corticospinal tracts. So you get a sense of how sophisticated this imaging data can become. And we'll see quite a few more of these. The last time I gave this talk, Dr. Miller said to me at the end, I'm not sure I completely understood everything you had to say, but you did have the most colorful grand rounds I've ever seen. And I hope by the time we're done, I'll prove Dr. Miller correct. Something else that many of my students know is that this is Phineas Gage. And in 1848, he used the tamping rod that he's seen holding here next to his unfortunate orbit, which he blew out with this tamping rod. He was tamping some uh, TNT down in granite, and he struck the side. Their spark lit off the TNT, resulting in this particular injury to Mr. Gage, a rather severe injury. This tamping rod blew right through his orbit, blew a huge hole in his head. And post-mortem, you can still view this in a museum in Cavendish, New Hampshire. And so you think, well, what is Phineas Gage? He has a lot to do with behavioral neurology, taught us a lot of things. But what does he have to do with the human connectome? Well, look here. Son of a gun. Here is Gage's head and using his skull reconstructed in the computer database and using a connectomic graphic, not only can we visualize what the nature of the functional injury actually was, but even more than that, we get a look at the various brain regions. And I'm going to show you a normal human connectome. But you can see here, there's a huge gap. And the gap, of course, is because he blew out a major portion of his executive functional area the frontal lobe. So you see that we can even use these connectomics uh, to visualize various brain damages, even historical ones where we don't have access to the actual brain itself. We can also use it, much like the Human Genome Project has taught us, we can, you know, you can call up one of various companies and find out what your ethnic heritage is, what your cultural history has been. In a very similar way, we can look at human evolution by looking at connectomics. Now, originally, 
you see here on the left, we had very simple graphics of this, but then they got more and more sophisticated. And as they became more sophisticated, we were able to apply things like density and fiber length to these connectomics and make better and better graphics to the place where now, for instance, this would be a basic normal human brain connectome. And you see the connections here. This was an earlier graphic. This is more like the things that are going on now. So we're using this to understand brain network theory in such a way that we can use these connectomes and the hubs to understand the various uh, connectomics that we see in the brain. So how do we go about doing this? Well, you start like this. You get a brain, take a little piece of it, cut it very thin, then you image it, and from there, you reconstruct that image using computer graphics, and then you visualize and analyze what you get. So for instance, a thin piece might look like this. You reconstruct the axons first, then the synaptic connections, then zoom in, and as these processes become increasingly sophisticated technologically, we are able to use the database to produce more and more information. So now, we can start with diffusion tensor imaging, we can start with fMRI, or even EEG data, and structurally and functionally map that, put it into the database, and then begin to publish it in the connectome viewer. The basic physics are that we use, especially magnetism, to drive eigenvectors. And I don't know whether you can see it well or not, but this little uh, Z axis right here, this is basically a water molecule driving in a straight line. And the computer is able to take that information and can do things then like visualize and analyze, here's a series of three neurons that it's actually done. So, then we can take high resolution, this is just a one Tesla MRI, and we can do that, and then use the computer program to segment it out, go from there, partition into the typical anatomical structures, usually thought of as about 66 different anatomical regions in the brain. But then you can partition into thousands. Once you get into thousands, you can begin to develop these connectomes. And you can use tractography and put that together so that you get increasingly sophisticated pictures of brain that we're coming to. So this is a typical MRI scanner. Okay, uh, I think most everybody in here is probably familiar with it. But those of you that maybe aren't MDs uh, might see this as valuable. We have had increasing sophistication with the technology of MRI. I remember the first time I ever used magnetic resonance spectroscopy was in an organic chemistry lab in, in college. And I remember the first time I ever heard about the idea of being applied to humans, I was thinking, well, what are we going to do, little fingers? Uh, you know, and then after a while, it became kind of amazing exactly how this technology proceeded, leading us to Dr. Feynman. Now, those of you that don't know, Feynman was out at Caltech and uh, uh, what was his name? Goldman uh, something, I can't remember. Anyway, he was chair at Caltech, and somebody said to him in a meeting one day, um, when you get physical problems that are absolutely impossible to solve, that nobody has enough mathematical skill to figure out, what do you do? And he goes, oh, that's very simple. We give it to Feynman and ask him what the answer is, and he tells us. So Feynman had a lot of insight into the nature of physics, and he was certainly correct about the idea that this MRI process has taken us into a level of imaging, especially as these computer databases have improved, that are just amazing. For instance, here we get a look at the myelin map. You can actually see myelin. You can actually see the nodes of Ranvier here. So it is incredible how the technology has successfully succeeded. This is a look at the interaction between auditory and visual cross-modal connectivity. 
So, you know, we think about things like the medial and lateral geniculates, the superior and inferior colliculus, and we think about that information processing occurring in those regions, and certainly they do. There's this cross-modal interaction between hearing and sight that is very important, but you get a look here at how that information is primarily processed at those primary areas, but then distributed cortically all over the brain in order to allow the entire cortex to come to bear on the interaction of auditory and visual performance. And you see here, uh, this is a particular look at the temporal lobes and some of the corpus callosum, and of course many of you are aware that visual and auditory processing in the temporal lobes is very substantial, especially in the superior temporal sulcus and the inferior and medial temporal gyri for the visual portion. Here's a look at some of the patterns, and you'll notice here there's not exactly, we don't have color coding uh, routines. For instance, here's corticospinal tract, okay? This is part of corona radiata, I believe. This is probably, uh, it's either brachium pontus or the vestibular apparatus. I'm not exactly sure about the yellow one. So, one of the things that will be helpful is as more of this evolves, and we get color coding routines so that you can compare all the time, it'll make it better. Here's an early look at a human brain connectome. Here's a more sophisticated sagittal look. We see here the corona radiata, uh, here brachium pontus, and again corticospinal tracts. So we are learning a tremendous amount of how the brain processes information uh, by shifting it around using these white matter tracks. Here's a more sophisticated look. You see the corpus callosum there in the middle, again the corticospinals. An early connectome, but here's an example of how technology has improved. As the time to focus has enhanced, you can see here from earlier to later you can see how much improvement there is in the graphics as the technology has progressed. Here we get a look at some interesting structures. For instance, the superior longitudinal fasciculus in green up here. Okay. Here's the arcuate fasciculus in part. Okay. And here is a very good image of the corona radiata itself. And again, this one, it's a good image of the corona radiata, but it's a little blurry. And you see here that earlier uh, imaging was not as sophisticated as where we are now. We're getting increasingly improved sophistication. Just in case anybody's kind of lost track of where we are, here is a connectomic superimposed over an MRI slice. So that'll give you a little better orientation. And you begin to get a sense of exactly how it is that we can see this then in three dimensions. And we can begin to see things like, for instance, this three-dimensional relationship to the specific positioning of, say, neurotransmitters. Well, we can also look at individualized neurons. As a matter of fact, we can paint neurons in almost 90 different colors. So any neuron, whether it's using a specific neurotransmitter or others, can be painted different colors. And overlapping that information with the connectomics allows us to really learn quite a bit about brain function. This is really the first 3D map of brain's neurons. This is an owl monkey brain. I don't think this owl monkey probably survived this procedure, but it is a very good 3D map. And, you know, I spoke a little bit about using connectomics to understand uh, how human cultural transitions have occurred. Not only human cultural transitions, we also can get a look at this. Now, Probably there are people in this room who have been involved in research projects with rhesus monkeys. Now, they're very similar to us, right? I mean, we think that they are. But when you look at the human brain and you see this, okay, and then you see this, 
the rhesus monkey brain. It's just not as evolved, not as developed, not as large, not as effective. The information transfer isn't as sophisticated. So not only can we look at human cultural heritage, we can also look at our position uh, in the phylogenetic chain. Now here's a very distinct look at some specific tracts. Here, red is corticospinal. The purple is the uncinate fasciculus between frontal lobe and temporal lobe, superior longitudinal fasciculus again. And then here is the arcuate fasciculus. This region right here would be where the amygdala is. But this is Wernicke's, the angular gyrus, and up here, Broca's. So we get a very good look at this white matter tract transmission. These association fibers are, these are just a list of some of them, okay? But we are learning more and more about how this is the same. Now, I got an interesting question the last time I was doing my behavioral neuro from uh, one of the medical students. The question was basically, okay, if the brains are all the same and if they're all wired like this, then, you know, why are people different? It's a good question, and there are kind of two answers to it, and these are the kinds of levels of sophistication we need to get to. In the reticular formation, down in the brainstem, it seems to be that the nature of your individuality is that the programming and the synaptic connections in the reticular formation are uniquely your own. So even if you have a uh, twin, an identical twin, still there will be some difference in experience of what happens to you, and that will be memorialized in the reticular formation. In addition to that, that's in the brainstem and low in the brain, probably very much part of our archetypal evolutionary heritage. In addition to that, though, on the outer cortex, memories are transitioned by way of hippocampus, parahippocampus, into the cortex where they're eventually memorialized. And each individual at the tertiary level, if you will, as opposed to the primary level, not at the reptilian functions level, but at the cognitive processing level, uh, everybody has their own set of synaptic connections in layer one of the cortex as well. So between the Reticular formation, which is probably uniquely yours based on your experiences ever since time in utero, okay? And the unique nature of the memorialization of the things in the memory in your mind, those two things are what make it different for each person while still keeping the basic technology, the basic engineering the same for everyone. So the brain, well, yeah. I say for everyone using this broad term, normal, I'm going to show you some things, for instance, in autism that may be a little different where they are different from what we might call everyone's normal. So I don't have anything about this one particularly. Uh, no, I, I'm going to take that back. Please look. This is an intro slide to the next slide. Look at the 3D grid-like overlay at this large level. But look now at this computer analyzed grid. Now we begin to see this true interweaving. It's almost like someone took a knitting needle and put these neurons together with a knitting needle. It is amazing how they interlace and how they interface and how much information processing that allows, directed largely by the white matter tracks, but then processed and fully sophisticated by the gray matter tracks. So these three-dimensional grid networks are how the brain is constructed. Now, at the same time, certain areas of the brain are much more influential than others. I showed you the right connectome with the relatively large control hubs. But here's a look at the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which essentially lights executive function throughout the entire brain. 
Now, we have known for a long time that DOPFC can be disordered in schizophrenia. And if you think about the nature of schizophrenia and the difficulties with reality testing, processing, autistic-like affects, such things, it's not hard to imagine how the DOPFC, if not putting on this coordinating executive function show, can lead to real deficits in emotional and cognitive function. Normally, the brain should have these very definitive connectomics. Okay? The green ones here uh, represent, uh, in particular, amygdala, amygdala down here, thalamus here. Okay, so you can see, uh, you can color code these things by how much information processing is occurring at any given level. And that information processing from an executive function point of view is very much occurring in different ways in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex where evaluation judgments are being made, and the orbitofrontal cortex where moral or ethical judgments are being made. We've gotten to the place where in this simple worm, the entire neural net can be thoroughly programmed. And in this particular worm, one of the things that they've discovered, this area right here, RMG, if the RMG is large and, in worm terms, relatively sophisticated, then the worm has pretty good control of going side to side, forwards and backwards. But on the other hand, in other subspecies of this worm, where the RMG is not as large, the worm can go a little side to side and forwards, but can't back up at all. So eventually, we'll be able to use this level of information on a simple animal such as this worm to be able to put this kind of information into understanding how human brain actually processes things. So, we can start off with simple things like tractography and go from there to these more and more and more increasingly sophisticated uh, analyses. Or, we can look at things like retina. Now, retina is very interesting. Uh, one of the things about the retina is that we have always perceived it as kind of a sensory perceptual tool, and that's sort of it. Well, you know, it's complicated and it's interesting. It's got a lot of different neuronal connection types. Matter of fact, uh, you can see here that we can label them in a wide variety of ways. The retina itself, though, is much more interesting than we knew. The retina is actually processing almost at the level of the central nervous system. So at the point of the impingement of light waves on the retina, the CNS processing is essentially coming into play. Now the total CNS processing of visualization is of course way more complex than just the retina. But I wonder, um, anybody that doesn't see the triangle, please raise your hand. Everybody sees the triangle? Well, I point out that in fact, nobody here sees the triangle. What you all see are the three little Pac-Men, okay, that delineate the triangle that your retina told your brain you're seeing. And I asked the question, as I did, to point out that the retina itself is actually getting the information of the three uh, near circle black spheres, but then the retina and its visual connections are processing in such a way that what we appear to have seen, in fact, is a triangle, especially if somebody like me asks you a leading question. So that's just the way that these things work. The brain has information superhighways. And the information superhighways pass from right to left, or they pass from anterior to posterior, or they pass superior to inferior. And this is a very important thing to understand because eventually these information superhighways will be key. It'll be like a map of the interstate highway system in the United States. 
to understanding the geography of how to get to every little place in the most efficient way. And there'll come a time we'll be able to. We'll be able to look at the corona radiata and the thalamus here. We'll be able to see it very distinctively. And what do we do with these kinds of information? Well, for instance, right now, you can get a look at the resting network or at the executive resting network. This is as if you were lying supine, flat in the bed, eyes closed, thinking of nothing, okay? Uh, the default mode network, if you will. And we can get a look at exactly what is activated in the brain when we're in that mode. We can ask people to take on functional thought activities and we can begin to look at the differential connectivity that accelerates when that happens. And that, of course, is occurring through, again, the corona radiata, the major white matter tracts of the brain. We can use these imaging techniques, for instance, to image brain tumors. Okay, see one here. And this information about visual stuff is, of course, always interesting in talking about the brain. One of the things that the brain does is uh, the posterior cingulate gyrus and the precuneus are very important visual association processing centers. And those areas are also associated with uh, the default mode network, okay? So even though there's visual processing going on there, when you close your eyes and you're not particularly visually processing, these areas still take on very influential uh, direction of brain activity. Another thing that we would like to understand more is why theory of mind areas exist both in the frontal lobes and in the parietal lobes. It makes some sense in the frontal lobes we're planning what to do in relation to our relationships to others. In the parietal lobes we're using our historical experiences to make associations about how to affect those plans. And so then you'll see here the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe have these connectors and these two areas uh, marked here as seven and eight light blue areas are very influential in theory of mind activity of the brain. Understanding the default, the default mode network and its relationship to the saliency network to the central executive, this is very important. So. If we're in a period of reflective consciousness and just not really thinking about anything specifically, that's one brain state. Once we start to evaluate things and decide what the emotional or the financial value or whatever value you might put on something is, then the saliency network comes into play. And once you're making judgments about what is salient to you on emotional or monetary grounds, then the central executive begins thinking how to put things into play. Now, all of these networks are very important to understanding consciousness in general, which we think is very closely connected. You may remember I had put up a list of white matter tracts, including the extreme capsule. There's a gray matter portion of the brain called the claustrum. You see it here in the bottom two sections. It's black there. Um, the claustrum is interconnected from both the thalamus, right here and right here. It's interconnected uh, from the thalamus, so some somatosensory information, sensory information in general, including limbic information, is coming into the thalamus and going to the claustrum. And the claustrum is the most connected region of the brain to the cortical regions overall. So Francis Crick, along with uh, Christoph Koch, were very much involved in the idea that the claustrum is intrinsically involved with uh, consciousness. I have a picture here to give you a better sense of where the claustrum is. Let me see if I can find it myself. Yeah, here, here's the claustrum, and then out here is the extreme capsule, external capsule, and of course the internal capsule in here. There's a little better look at the gray matter claustrum. It's not quite as complicated. So these um, 
Associations into the cortex are very important because the cortex has six major regions. The outer region where associations are memorialized is level one. Levels two and three represent uh, transconfigurational information processing from level one into level four. Level four of the brain is the thalamic inbox, if you will. And then there is another transconfiguration in level five to the thalamic outbox, level six. So the thalamus is consistently bidirectionally connected to the cortex. And in this way, information can be input, determined as to how important it is, and then memorialized as necessary, as directed by areas like the hippocampus. Eventually, we would like to have these connectomes sophisticated enough that we could very regularly predict where various neurotransmitters are. That would be very helpful. And here we see a variety of different fMRI states. Uh, the first one is low-level visual, okay? So this is low-level visual, but the occipital cortex is very much involved. This is a higher level visual region, okay? Now what's happening is, instead of the occipital cortex just kind of taking things in, it's now deciding what to specifically process, how to do that. Then we get to sensory motor processing, okay? The sensory uh, strips. Here we see the primary default mode network, and look here. It's largely posterior, mostly midbrain, but in the primary resting network, the frontal lobe is still kind of active, okay? Now, we've talked, we've recently had a talk on mindfulness, and the issue is important to many of us. The issue of mindfulness, kind of letting go of concerns. When you get into a much deeper resting state, the default mode network now becomes very much midline. And look here, those frontal planning activities begin to be excluded. So we can use this kind of information to understand brain states at such levels. Here's a look at what happens when we throw uh, hormones into the system, okay? So over here on the right, there's an injection of placebo and not much is happening. But look here, an injection of oxytocin. All of a sudden, the affiliative areas of the brain, medial prefrontal cortex, planning what to do, temporal parietal junction, taking in information, associating it effectively, fusiform gyrus. Those, you know, I have a one-year-old granddaughter, and let me tell you, I, every time my daughter-in-law hands my granddaughter to my wife, I can see the oxytocin flowing, okay? And they are fixated on that child's face. And then, of course, the superior temporal solstice, where auditory processing is involved, comes into play as well. Um, we get these looks at how we can, we're beginning to understand that we can weight the control hubs so that we can know how much information processing is going on at any given time. And here's a look at certain children with autism. So let's look here, okay? And uh, where'd I go? Let's look. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Look here. This is kind of what normal brain weighting is going to look like. We get to children with autism, okay? And especially those that have a certain methionine variant can show very low synchrony and don't seem to have effective daydreaming networks. Now, I'm not sure exactly how to place that into the context of what autism can be, but it is interesting. It may almost be as if they are so impacted by reality that unlike others without the traits, they can't kind of take a break briefly. They're just constantly impacted. And we see here uh, in an autistic brain, there may be dampened communication overall between distant brain regions. 
So the normal connectomics that should look like this, allowing for very long distance information processing throughout the brain in a variety of ways. You know, for instance, here we see the, haven't talked about the fornix, but going around with the hippocampus over to the septal region. We see that there, okay, and the corpus callosum at the top. You see these long distance communications occurring. That's what normally should be happening in the brain. And as um, certain things happen, atrophy patterns will change these connectomics. And so, we're using these to understand these very basic ideas of how the brain does these things. We're using it especially to begin to understand things like the default mode network, the executive control network, we're working to begin to get this information, not only about information transfer, neurotransmitter location, but also many of you have seen the pictures, the standard pictures of emotions on faces. And in the fusiform gyrus talk that I have, I have this series of emotions on faces and they're universally able to be called happy or angry or sad. People just recognize them for that. We'd like to be more sophisticated. We'd like to be able to kind of understand some of the more unusual emotions like this particular one. Some of you may remember when Mr. Bush tried to walk off the Chinese stage and found a rather locked door. So I guess he had a moment of negative surprise. So meanwhile, these connectomics can be very valuable in a wide variety of scientific ways. They can be particularly valuable in looking at traumatic brain injury because the white matter tracks and their effective coherence is a very important feature in traumatic brain injury. And so ultimately, I have tried today to give you some insight into one of the things that truly fascinates me, how the brain functions, what we do know, what we don't know, how the technology that we have at the current time is highly, highly sophisticated. And this fellow said it well, and I hope I did a good enough job for you by his definition. I think most of you know him. So, thank you very much. Questions? Hi, Dr. Hendrick. Thank you hey, for the presentation. Thank you. Um, so you showed it the connectomics in uh, uh, brain uh, for someone with oh. an uh, uh, autism spectrum disorder. Yes. I'm wondering, um, and I assume, I assume there must be, um, if first of all, um, for people with uh, uh, other pronounced type disorders, if we have connectomics for that as well, for people with depression, for people with anxiety disorders for people with personality disorders. Um, that's my first question. Second off, I'm wondering how far away you think we might be from being in a place where we can actually uh, snip away certain connections or even create certain connections mm -hmm. to um, reduce or encourage certain behaviors or states or whatnot. Well, the, these questions, and I'm sorry, I thought he was handing it to Dr. Kendall, so Dr. Bach, excuse me for misidentifying you. Um, anyway, uh, the questions are easy, no and no. Now, they're not so easy. What, what, I'm, what I'm saying is we're becoming increasingly sophisticated about knowing, in terms of the first one, uh, different disease states. Yes, we are getting there. But they are so multifactorial, they're going to be very difficult. The other thing is, the comments that I made about what causes an individual to be individuated. Those very specific synaptic connections at level one of the cortex and in the brainstem, it's going to be extremely complicated to get to that level of mapping. I, th I think that in time we will be there, but I don't foresee it in my career and probably not in yours. Uh, it's just such a big chore. So people have been wrong about things like that before. 
uh, maybe, you know, maybe we will all of a sudden get lots of interesting new information about what constitutes the depressed looking brain. For instance, that uncinate fasciculus, the connection between the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. Apparently, relative incoherence in that is very closely associated with psychopathy and sociopathy. So that feature is already sort of known, and they're doing things at Mass General with that now uh, on their forensics units. But getting to the place where we can really understand a psychopathological structure, we're not there yet. Um, and I'm sorry, the second question was about Ah, yeah. I think that we're getting information like this. The younger you are, and the more that you press your brain intellectually, emotionally, performance, all of those things, the more that you press yourself to do and to know, then the more likely you are to have prophylaxis in time against dementiform process, that kind of thing. So that information is being buttressed by this kind of idea. We're seeing that. But I think that's as far as we can go right now. I, you know, on the other hand, you can go on the internet and probably buy at least a dozen different intellectual enhancers. Please let me know if one of them makes you into a genius more than you are now. Uh, I, I could use one. But uh, anyway, I think that's kind of where we are right now. We're getting this information, but it, it is still early. Of course, this is a hugely funded project. It's probably unfortunate that more of the funds aren't in academic world. They're pretty much in DARPA's hands. So we'll see what comes of that. Um, so I guess from a clinician standpoint, what I'm wondering about is, in terms of applicability, you know, one of the things that they talk about early on was you know, for kids, for example, if you expose them to multiple languages early on, mm -hmm. they will pick it up a lot faster. But there's also some suggestion now that's saying that on the other end, if you do that, they may not actually be able to learn the primary language as quickly or as early or as, as well as kids that don't have, say, four different languages that are getting exposed to. So is more pressure good to develop more tracks uh, or, or not? I mean, from a clinician standpoint, I'm kind of yeah. curious. You know, I'm no expert on that kind of thing with child. I am a firm believer that the more varied and multiple stimuli that a child can experience at younger ages improves things because it allows the brain to adjust to all sorts of different circumstances and environments. The specific question you're asking about language, though, you know, Language is so very specific. I, I can't remember the exact number. It's either 44 or 46 human sounds that constitute the entire breadth of all human language. So I can imagine if you take a child very young and you expose them to, say, four languages, and they're working on those 46 human sounds until their brain has differentiated enough you can see how those things could begin to really blend together in such a way that the idea that they would have best mastery of their primary language might be complicated. I, I, that's an interesting point. And I'm no expert, but I know that much about it and think that all that blending of, you know, after all, you know, we squeak and chirp and tweet and twerp our verbal skill all the time. And if it's just constantly blended, it might be hard to mature into just using the one language or just using specific words without peppering your commentary with uh, words in other languages. I had uh, two questions for you, John. One is if you would uh, differentiate the utility of a diffusion spectrum imaging from diffusion tensor imaging and mapping the connectome. And uh, which, which you were hinting at along the way as you were showing the slides. And another is more of a, a broader question about mapping the connectome entirely. And how do you see the future in that? Will it happen from the top down in terms of tracts? Or will it happen from the micro resolution network at the cellular level? 
uh, where do you think ultimately the research will go to enable us to get to the entire connectome being mapped? It, you know, I think they're kind of interrelated because I think I don't do this work. I teach about this work, which I read about. So I think where things are going is DTI, and that's going to be the driving force. I think it's going to be that. And as a result of that, my guess is they will try first and get the white matter tracks as mapped as they can and then go down. That's what it seems like to me. And I don't know that I have more to say about uh, DTS versus DTI than to say that it seems to me like the money seems to be focused on DTI. And I think that's probably what's going to drive this. Best I know to answer your question. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. And uh, Dr. Miller would be happy because it was quite beautiful, too, the <laughs> picture. I appreciate that. I was wondering if you could make a comment on uh, particularly the connectomes and if they've been studied from a perspective of the enteric nervous system and how it connects to the brain. Oh, you know, actually, that is a fascinating question because, for instance, that worm, worm connectome that I put up, the whole idea that the enteric nervous system has markedly more influence in the central nervous system than we had recognized. And conversely, that the central nervous system through the enteric nervous system has tremendous amount of influence in the viscera per se. Um, that is being looked at. Now, I'm not aware, I'm not aware that it's gotten very far in terms of this kind of imaging material. Maybe it has, maybe I'm just behind on that information. But the idea that eventually the enteric nervous system will be able to be mapped into these connectomics and we'll be able to see these control hubs being tremendously influenced by the enteric nervous system, I don't think there's any question that that's the case. Um, I, I spend a fair amount of time talking about the insular, the insula in the brain and its idiovisceromotor connections from prefrontal cortex into the gut by way of the vagus nerve and, of course, by way of the enteric nervous system overall. I think that one of the most important things we're going to learn about the holistic nature of what humanness is, for that matter, what life is, is going to be understanding those brain-gut connections. So. Um, I'm not aware that there's a whole lot of progress in terms of things like imaging on it, but I do believe that there is a tremendous amount of information that's going to prove to be just crucially important. Things like nucleus solitarius, stuff like that, very important information. I'm not a medical person, so I always find these kinds of presentations very interesting. I've often wondered, why do some people have what's called the photographic memory? They can read an article and recall everything about the article years later, and some people can barely remember the title of the article they read years later. Why do some people have a higher IQ and a better memory when some do not? What, what process in the brain recalls that or, or processes that? Well, we would be happy to invite you into the medical uh, field because we ask those questions as well. Um, first of all, I think that there's this term that gets thrown around called multifactorial, which means we don't know because it's too complicated. Uh, and I, you have to use it, though, when you ask questions like that because there's a genetic basis that is the template on which things develop. And that is extraordinarily influential in things like vision and attention. Okay, those, it's just gonna be. But from there, as Dr. Chandraya had asked me about, exposure to multiple stimuli or multiple languages. From that come these learning experiences 
that get memorialized in the low brain and at the edge of the upper brain. And those learning experiences then begin to develop specific skills. And some of those things could include specific visualization capacities, for instance, okay? Or one, one way I guess I would put it, in the course of your life, I bet you've known a lot of different people that play sports, some of whom seem to be like naturals. They walked on to whatever field it was, and they just were doing it from there forwards. But the vast majority of people, for one person who's a natural baseball player, okay, the other 9,999 in a group of 10,000 have to work and work and work to get just competent at, at the sport. So some of it is genetic, some of it is learning, and some of it is these control hubs for certain people may be programmed in certain ways that they not only are very good at something, but because they're very good at it, they're kind of drawn to it because they know they're good at it. So it's kind of a mutual thing. Um, those are tough questions and you know, get into this issue of nature and nurture all the time. What is learning? What are you born with? Um, in particular, it's interesting that it is said that there was a particular groove, a, a sulcus, in Einstein's brain that appeared to be missing. Now, he was a very interesting study in the kind of thing you're talking about. He could barely do math. Okay, so, you know, you ask him to do something complicated like ask, add 7 to 12, difficult process for him. But he more or less thought in differential equations and general topography. Now, is that because his brain had an area that didn't allow for simple calculations to be easily done, but sort of, if you will, unwalled the ability to do things like complex differential equations just in his head. Okay? Feynman, another person like that, really came up with miraculous mathematical answers. It's very hard to know why people have those skills, but sometimes some people do. So, very interesting questions. It's the kind of thing that this eventually will drive at. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.